Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And it's my pleasure to be today with you in this uh, first alumni online seminar of the year. My name is Maria Laura Sorrentino. I'm alumni officer at Aichi Delft, and I will have the pleasure to be the moderator of this session today that we will have as a guest speaker and alumna, Dr. Afu Abusu, that is alumna of IHE Delft and works nowadays in the International Water Management Institute as a doctoral researcher. And she is also associate editor at the Hydrological Science Journal. Afua, that is at the moment in Africa, completed her PhD program at IHE Delft and TU Delft in November 2022. And she received or has won the inaugural Falcon Mark Award for the best PhD thesis for her work on the protection and restoration of natural flowing rivers through the provision of environment flows or E flows. The prize awarded by the International Association of Hydrological Science recognizes outstanding contributions of hydrological understanding of water scarcity and water supplies. Well, today is an honor to have uh, Dr. Afua as our speaker, where she will tell us about her research and her findings. But before passing the word to, to her, I would like to invite you, all of the attendees, to keep the microphone and the camera off so that to focus on the presentation of Dr. Afua Obusu and also to introduce briefly uh, in the chat where are you from and where are you working if you wish and later please uh, write there also in the chat the questions that you would like to ask to Dr. Afua. Please Ulat, I would like you to put your camera out please. So, without further ado, I would like to pass the word to Dr. Afua Ansa. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to present my work from my PhD to all of you. And I hope that by the time I'm done, you'll all become ambassadors of environmental fluids wherever you are. So, um, I'd just like to go and get started. I'll share my screen. Um, so yes, this is the title of my thesis, and it's been two years, and I admit I had to go and pick up my thesis to read a few sections, but um, generally I think I'm up to date. So the title is The Practice and Opportunities in Reoperating Dams for the Environment, and this was done at IIT Delft to Delft part of the science program, and it was a Marie Curie um, project um, sponsored by the EU. So I'm beginning with just a short history of dams. So as human beings have been damming rivers for centuries, beginning with simple stone and earthen dams, but then dam construction really picked up in the 20th century. And by the estimates of the World Commission on Dams, by 1949, there were about 5,000 large dams, but by 2000, this was about 45,000 dams. And this is a graph showing um, just different databases. And the actual numbers may differ, but the trend is generally the same. It's quite low in the 19th century, and then by the 20th century, there's a huge jump. So this is a map showing the general distribution of the dams. The darker the color, the more dams there are, the bigger the dots, the larger the capacity. So this is um, the grand database. So you generally see in America, in China, in Australia, in Brazil, and then in Africa, we have Southern African countries and a few West African and Northern countries, India as well, and yeah, Europe. So you see the general distribution of dams. And I like to read this quote because it gives you an idea of just the, the mindsets behind damming in the 20th century. Basically, water flowing to the sea was considered wasted. And so it was like, we're going to tame the river, we're going to control it, we're going to take as much as we need from it. So yesterday, the Colorado River was a natural menace. Unharnessed, it tore through deserts, flooded 
fields and ravaged villages. It drained the water from the mountains and the plains, rushed it through sun-baked thirsty lands, and dumped it into the Pacific Ocean, a treasure lost forever. Man was on the defensive. He sat helplessly by to watch the Colorado River waste itself, but attempted in vain to halt its destruction. Today, this mighty river is recognized as a national resource. Tomorrow, the Colorado River will be utilized to the very last drop. So the whole idea was that if water was flowing to the sea, it was wasted, and we were going to dam it, uh, divert it, use it as much as we could, so that if we have our way, there'll be no water flowing to the seas. But then, generally, with time, society's views on dams change. And the reports by the World Commission on Dams were the landmark reports in this regard. Um, so this um, regard, uh, one of the points made in the um, World Commission on Dams report was that dams have made an important contribution to human development. However, an unacceptable and often unnecessary and high price has been paid especially in social and environmental terms to secure those benefits. And alongside this, there was also the science of environmental flows, which is defined as the quantity, timing, and quality of freshwater flows and levels that is required to sustain aquatic ecosystems, which in turn support human cultures, economies, sustainable livelihoods, and well-beings. So we have all of this happening, and under um, the environmental flows, um, science that the whole thing about the natural the natural flow regime is the best flow regime for a river because that's what encompasses everything that a river should be but then there's also the um, pragmatic approach which was, which accepts that rivers were done for a purpose we can't go back to being natural and that's called the um, design flow regime so in addition to all of these you know paradigms and arguments and environmental flows there were um, there was also this paper by Bunn and uh, Atherton, which identified four principles on the mechanisms that link hydrology to aquatic biodiversity. And then there was also a review by um, Rebecca Tham, and like everybody in the environmental flows world knows this paper, it's written in 2003, but it's like cited God knows how many times. And she actually got the whole, uh, organized the whole science of environmental flows into how do we establish environmental flows. So there's the hydrological method, the hydraulic method, holistic method. She just curated all of these approaches and then organized it very well. And that was great. So this, now I come to my P, um, PhD. And the whole idea was to um, have, and I, we, we know that environmental flows are generally good. It's accepted that how dams are operated, it's not working out exactly as we thought. There are numerous scientific methods, like I highlighted by some, over 203, but we are not seeing the implementation. I guess it's a bit, it's not as, it's like climate change in a way. We, we all know the science, but in terms of changing our ways of living and everything that we need to do, it's not influencing practice. Um, so the red arrows and the red dots basically are showing where the gaps are in the understanding of how if those theory becomes um, policy, how environmental flow recommendations become dam operation policy. And in addition to that, we also want to understand the practice of it. So once environmental flows are being released, what is how what is the outcome? And then what are the trade-offs between the environment we're trying to protect and services, services from the environment and the conventional uses that we build the dams for, like hydropower, irrigation, navigation, and all those other benefits that make our lives very comfortable. So this table is just showing you the link between the research objectives, which were two, deepen understanding of dam reoperation policy uh, processes to accommodate e-flows. And then the second one is to investigate synergies and trade-offs between e-flow conventional uses. And yeah, so I won't go into details on the research questions, the activities linked to the research questions, the outputs, and um, luckily now all the papers have been published. So um, that's for further reading if you're interested. So generally, there's the part one. The part one is looking at the history of dam uh, environmental flows implementation. And um, 
part two is looking at a specific case study. So I'll start with part one. And that was answering the question, how do environmental flows recommendations develop into actual dam um, operation? And I use a simple logic model to understand this. And a logic model is like a flow diagram which captures the inputs, activities, output outcomes, and impacts of a project. So in this respect, the inputs are like the drivers, the conditions which led to recommendations or a decision to reoperate dams for the environment. Activities are the practices adopted to implement the decision, and the output is hopefully successful dam reoperation. I didn't look at um, the long-term outcomes because a, a number of papers had looked at that trying to make the case that, hey, look at the outcomes of environmental flows. Um, why isn't everybody reoperating them? I wanted to understand the first bit. What is planned and what comes out as a result. So basically looking through the literature, um, a systematic literature review was done and we started with thousands of papers and ended up with, I think the specific numbers, I think about 61 papers and um, cases of dam reoperation. And the general trend, it goes with the countries that have the most dams generally. We have a lot of cases in America, cases in New South, uh, New South Wales in um, Australia, cases in China, cases in South Africa, a few cases in West Africa and then Europe. So we can see that we are missing like even a whole continent over here. <laughs> but that these were the places where there had been documentation of um, environmental flu. So the USA had 28, Australia had 12 cases. And of course, it's very few compared to the existing dam database, ir ir irrespective of the database you're using. So what did we find? We found that generally legislation provides a legal basis for changes to be made, however reluctantly. So if you put a law and it doesn't necessarily need to be an environmental flows law. It can be a flow, uh, ecology or endangered species law. When you have that, generally they trigger a process to protect the river, which a lot of the time has to do with changing how the dam is operated. So environmental flow assessments, um, and also there are cases where litigation, so you've got like an existing river and there are laws there and then whoever is in charge is not doing as the law says, and then you have environmentalists or people taking them to court and then they win. And then you want natural events, like a shock to the system, like the Millennium Drought in the Murray Darling Basin in Australia. That was a shock to the system. And then they realized, okay, things need to change. Now I'll just move to um, the activities that are done. You have flow experiments, which are kind of, um, we are testing out the system. Let's see if we release a flood, what happens if we, um, release a small pulse of water, what happens? And these are activities that are done most frequently in dam reoperation. And then of course there are workshops, physical modifications of the dam, which are done. And then finally, in terms of output, what is generally done when we say we are releasing environmental flows? And you'll find that a lot of the time is the release of a, a minimum flow, which is um, the whole thing that, um, the river is diverted and water is used up to an extent and then you have times where it dries out or the temperature gets so high, you have fish scales occurring. So let's ensure that there's a certain minimum amount of water flowing in the river all the time. But then there's more to environmental flows than minimum flows. Yeah, I mean, flood releases, if you will recall, the ban and earth and tin graph, I showed I didn't dwell on it, so probably you won't, but there's more to it than just minimum flows. There are high flows, pulse, pulses, flood releases, and how you increase and decrease the flow rate. That also has an impact on the river uh, ecology. So now the next question was, what's happened in cases where dam reoperation has been attempted, but has yet to be implemented? So in this case, we're looking at how dams are reoperated. We have that from the logic model. Who was involved in the process? What dams they worked on? Why the release of e flows was desired? And what hurdles did they encounter? So in this case, we got a better representation across the globe. Um, 
Yeah. So basically, the red ones are the ones that have stalled. The blue ones are the ones that have been successful. So it was very good that we got a fairly good distribution. And this survey was sent out, I think, for over three months to all the people who had written on environmental flows. People recommended, you know, just a snowballing method to send it out. So we got information on what really went into the process and why have some cases stalled. So um, uh, using the Fisher exact test, we did some statistics and we found out that generally having legislation and a scientific research base as input is a big determinant. There's a huge, your odds of um, successful dam reoperation is very high. And um, having flow experiments as an activity is also makes it very high that you'll uh, reappraise the dam. And then having uh, a stakeholder, scientists and the general public is also very important for increasing your odds of successful dam reappraisal. So we had this open-ended question where we were asking, so just to get more details, what are the hurdles that I encountered? And we could group them into four classes, technical or science-related hurdles, uh, hurdles to do with stakeholder, network involved, um, hurdles on policy, and then hurdles from the fiscal constraints in available water or infrastructure, um, resulting in a high trade-off between, let's say, environmental flows and hydropower, whatever the dam is being used for. So you'll see that generally when you compare the successful implemented to the stalled cases, the issues have to do with stakeholder and a lack of legislation. While for successful cases, the, the physical hurdle was mainly the, the, the problem. For stalled cases, it was stakeholders and legislation. How are the hurdles overcome? And you'll see that consultations was a big thing and then scientific studies, a few cases. And the interesting thing with stalled cases was nothing was done. And if you have a hurdle and nothing is done, then nothing will happen. So we move to the next section. Yeah. And that was on the case study. And in that case, it was to um, look at a real life case. And the, what made this case interesting was the fact that it had quite a number of the features of successful cases, um, mainly the fact that it was like a multi-year project um, with multiple stakeholders involved. We, the, the effect of the dam was very clear to everyone, for everyone to see. And yeah, so that was it. And we were in, interested in I, understanding what the inflow requirements of the case study was, and then what were the trade-offs between environmental flows and water uses. So the case study was in the Lower Volta River. It's in West Africa. It's the most downstream sub-basin of the Volta River, which is um, cuts across Burkina Faso, Ghana mainly, but also a bit of Mali and Benin and Togo and Cote d'Ivoire. And the most interesting thing about the dam, uh, the Lower Volta is the dam which creates the largest man-made river by surface area in the world. So that gives you an idea of just the amount of sheer flooding that occurred. So in the dam, the Akosumbo Dam was built in 1965 and in 1981, a smaller dam was built downstream. It's called the Kong Dam. And it has a much smaller capacity of 116 megawatts. So this is a nice picture which I didn't take, but it's a nice picture of the dam, I think. And what we use was um, in, in terms of an indicator species. So and uh, we need, after a, a bit of literature and going back and forth, we settled on using the Volta clam as an indicator species. And what makes it wonderful is that it's, um, it's a macro, macro benthic bi bivalve. So it's, it's not going to swim away if conditions <laughs> Conditions become bad, so you'll see what happens to its life cycle and extent habitat when things are not going right in the river. And it was previously abandoned in um, the lower volta. And since the dam was built, you can see the 
huge difference in where you can find the um, the clam. So just pay attention to the stars. Initially, the Volta clam could be found here from Akuse, the yellow star to Sogakope. And that's a reach of about 80 kilometers. After the dam was built, pay attention here, you'll see two green stars. It shifted the range and narrowed the range to just 10 kilometers from 80. But what did we get as a trade-off? When the dam was built upstream, over 80,000 people resettled, one of the worst cases when it was occurring. And then we had a whole a whole industries of creek fishing, floodplain agriculture, clam fishery, which made up 75% of total real income of the riparian population just collapsing. You have aquatic invasive, oops, sorry, aquatic invasive species. And then that they create a habitat for disease vectors and diseases. And then we have that issue with coastal irrigation. So um, fortifying the coast of Ghana is something that just, it's something we just have to keep doing. And it not when we do that, we impact Benin, we impact Togo. So this was the, um, yeah, the pre dam flow, generally average monthly flow. You have very low flows and then it peaks. And this is the range, it could go this high in September and October, and then it would come down. But now with the dam, we want steady, reliable energy. So it's always at a thousand meter cube per second, which is great for hydropower, but not so great for every other living organism in the river and around the river. So in exchange for all of these issues created, we have lovely resorts in the dam. We've got affordable hydropower, as I mentioned. We've got irrigation schemes. If you squint, you'll see. <laughs> We've got tourism and lake transportation. So using the live uh, the climate, the volta climate as an indicator species, the whole thing was we need to understand its life cycle and where it occurs. So the blue is the current flow regime, post dam. The red is the pre dam flow regime in uh, Cumex. And these colors uh, represent when spawning and fertilization occurs, which generally peaks from July to Okay, from July to October, peaking in September, and then um, when that happens, you have larvae, villager larvae of the clam, which require a certain salinity, and that's why it's interesting if you look at the extent of the dam, the the clam, you'll see that initially before the dam, you can have salt intrusion all the way get into where um, Pong Dam is now situated. But now once the dam created a steady flow, the dry season, the low flows don't go so low. So then the sea is not able to intrude much into land. And we found that generally this is as far as it gets. So this is as far as the velica lava of the clam can survive. And so that is, um, that's, that's requirement for salt, a certain percentage of salt became a very important finding from literature. And, um, you'll see that recruitment is continuous, but then there's a major pause in October to March. So using a Bayesian be, uh, belief network, um, this involved going on the field and mapping um, just chemical properties and then talking to fishermen on the um, clam fishermen applying their trade just get an understanding of what they're doing we came up with this Bayesian belief network which links flows and activities stand winning the type of substratum whether there's a sandbar the estuary to the clam extent and this is what we found that one the key flow period is November to March. And that's when the Veliga lava is, um, is yeah, as it's, as, as, when the clam is at the, at the life stage of the Veliga lava, that's when flow has to be low. It can't be at the thousand meter cube all year round. That doesn't work for the Veliga lava. And because of that, they can't swim up and uh, colonize or 
settle in the original stretch, they are forced to be where they can get that salt percentage. And so using the variation belief network, we're able to come up with the conditions that ensure that the clam um, bed extent is either maintained or increased. So using this, and I think I have five minutes, so <laughs> I'll just try and be fast. This was the final bit of my research where before I um, we determined the clam environmental flows, which I just described, there had been two environmental flows um, recommended based on the natural flow regime. And so we got the clam flows, which is recommending that we should have 50 to 330 meter cube from November to March to support the lava stage. But there's also an environmental flow recommendation, which I'm calling EFLOWS2, which reinstates the natural flow dynamic in September and October to basically the bank full flow. And then the rest of the year, they're recommending 700 meter cube per second. And then EFLOWS3, which is um, recommended even higher flows to extend to cost flooding of approximately 156 km to support creek fishing and flood research in agriculture, then a lower dry season flow. So the whole thing was to understand what are the trade-offs between these environmental flows and existing water users. So we use radial basis functions to uh, parameterize the control policy for mapping water levels in the dam and time to how the dam uh, water should be released from the dam. And we considered annual hydropower from a Kusumbo, which generally there's a firm power demand of 400 and 4,000 gigawatts uh, per year. And there's also a foam, which um, generally is a run of the river. So whatever Kusumbo releases, they release and generate with that. And then there's also irrigation. Current demand is 10 meter cube per second, but there have been plans since 2009 to increase this. We don't know when that will happen, but we just went to the higher demand. And then there's also flood control. Since the uh, Kosovo Dam was built, people have moved in and encroached. And generally, we don't want it to flood. So there was a, a control, flood control objective of not letting flow releases exceed 2,000 meter cube per second. And then there are three e flows I presented earlier. So the way to understand this is just to consider a um, Pareto efficiency that generally, it gets to a certain point, you can't move on the objectives of, the objectives you have without trading off on one, uh, on one thing or the other. So if you think about living in the center of town and uh, so that your commute, your commute to work is shorter, you'll find that generally there's a high cost involved in that because the center of town, the um, houses are more expensive. So generally you can't improve on being close to work without trading off on the cost of the apartment you're paying. And this is how it looks when you have multiple objectives. So um, the whole thing is once, um, this is the direction of preference and everything has been um, standardized so that the zero represents the lowest um, value and one is the highest value. So we want ideally a flat horizontal line across everything so that we eat our cake and have it. We have irrigation, maximum hydropower at home, maximum hydropower at Akosombo, maximum environmental flows and no flat. But life is not that way. And the most important thing is the huge X between hydropower and environment showing that when one is at its highest point, you're going to have the other at the lowest, and when the other is at its, yeah, vice versa. So um, red is best hydropower, green is best environment, and so uh, on. When you have a lighter red, a pink, that's fair hydropower, and that's fair is being used to represent 80% of the time, we get 80% we, we get of what we are trying to target, and that applies to fair environment. And every single line here is a Pareto uh, efficient solution. It means that it's really as good as it gets for all the options. But if I want to look at the one that's best for hydropower, this is the dark red line. 
And if I want to look at what's best for um, environment is the green line and for irrigation is the blue line. Yes, so basically the highest performing dam operation policies for hydropower trade off sharply with environmental flows for all configurations. Um, but if you look at the clam, and this is clammy flows, E flows two, E flows three, um, clammy flows does better because the requirement is just that the restriction on flows just is for November to March. And the rest of the year, you could maximize hydropower to what you need it to be. The thing with um, E flows two and three is that you need floods. And that is not a, a, a Pareto efficient solution under any circumstance. So the best environment you can get for those is at 0 0.83. So um, I don't know, uh, Maria, if I have extra time, then I would go into the work we did for future yes, scenarios. You can uh, take a few minutes more, Fua. And I would like to invite all the audience to start to write the questions on the chat box, please. Okay, thank you. So um, we looked at different scenarios where we have an annual, based on a, a literature review, another not so systematic, but fairly good systematic literature review. We found the prediction that I made about flows to the Volta Lake. And what we saw was that there's, there's generally one that talks about an annual increase 45%, um, annual decrease, sorry, in flows, 45%, annual increase of 12%, fairly low, and then 65% increase too. And then there's also the seasonality um, changes where in the dry season, we have a decrease, but in the wet season, we have a small increase. And then we have the one dry season decrease, wet season, very high um, increase. So running that in the model, what we see is when there's 45% um, decrease, then, I mean, we're in trouble for hydropower. The best we can do is 2,700 gigawatts hour when the, the target is 4,400 or so. So in that case, a hydropower shifts down on their axis, but we are still able to make a climate environmental flows because what we need is actually low flows. So if there's no water, we're able to provide low flows. Not so well on the uh, E flows two and three, but similar to baseline because they also require low flows for about seven or so months and then the floods, which it's not happening because there's no water. And so, we move to the next two, which is a slight increase of 12%, slight um, significant increase of 65%. And you'll see that they are showing that we can have all the hydropower we want, but yeah, it's a similar thing with um, the environment where we can maximize in the other months where we don't need to ensure climb, the lava is okay. And then we have a seasonality. Now, the, if you remember the graph of Akosombo inflows naturally, it's a very seasonal river where you've got 75% of the flows occurring in about four months of the year. So when you have seasonality, uh, the, the change in the dry season is not in absolute terms. It's actually quite small. So you'll find that this scenario, it's quite similar to this slide's annual increase. And it's similar to this scenario where the wet season increase being very large makes it similar to the um, annual um, increase. So um, it's just the relative placement of the the Pareto optimal lines for hydropower, which slightly change for the two comparable scenarios. So what are the conclusions that dam reoperation Attempts usually follow a nonlinear collaborative analytical process, which makes use of existing supporting framework, but also takes advantage of opportunities that may arise to advance the process. Um, we got new insights on the importance of collaborative positioning of science, local level legislation, and flow experiments in the process. 
of dam reoperation. And also the in-depth examination of the unique case, it shows that things don't generally fit into what you see for the whole grand picture when you're looking at um, lots of cases together. And so local context is very important in the success of dam reoperation. And for the lower volta, we saw that um, the designer e-flow does a better job than the, um, the environmental flows based on um, the natural flow regime. Just talking about the pragmatism of it, that we can't go back. Uh, Ghana depends so much on hydropower from uh, Akosombo. We, we need environmental flows that, I don't want to say fit in, but um, consider the hydropower requirements as well. And then insights into the trade-off, and notably both an increase and a decrease in annual flows to the Akosombo Dam, which is a trade-off and creates synergies between environmental flows and hydropower generation. So um, that's it. These are the papers associated with um, the thesis. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Afua Wusu. It's our great pleasure to have you as a speaker today. Uh, you can take one second to, to have a glass of water Thank after you. your presentation. And I will remind uh, all the attendees, please, to write the questions in the chat. And in the chat, too, I have uh, added some links that you will get it also in the final email that will I will send with the link to the video of this presentation. And let us go to the questions. So the first question is by Abel Inmaray, that is from Australia. And of course, he said, thank you very much, Dr. Afua. Very informative and well presented. The question, I couldn't quite see the detail in the pre-dam, post-dam seasonable, can I see the question? Seasonable. Seasonality radiograph. Yes. Okay, so I'll have to share my screen again. And is then, it done uh, subject to thermal stratification and do cold water releases effect visibility of Volta clams? Okay, so um, let me share my screen and share. So initially, I presented the seasonality of the um, the Akosombo Dam. So the blue line is the um, pre-dam situation where you could have um, peak flows reaching up to 12,000 meter cube per second in September and October and you could get flows getting very close to zero. So I went on then to represent this in this radial graph where you've got um, the pre-dam the pre-dam in the red and overlapping in purple with the blue. So that's where you see the peaks in October and September and then close to zero February, March. And then you've got the current, which is 1,000 meter cube per second every year. And you're asking about temperature, which um, we did measure here. <laughs> we did measure when we went on the field, but I didn't present. Let me see if I can find it in the actual presentation for this um, part of the work. But we found that generally it was the salt that was where the um, salt starts salinity starts and stops and too high salinity the lava do not extend there so they, they, they do not settle as um, um, adult clams there and too low salinity to that that was the limit so we found that all the other things we were measuring temperature chlorophyll nitrate phosphorus it wasn't um, helping it was basically the um, It was basically this extent of um, salinity that really showed where you'll find the um, clams. Um, does that answer your question? You will let us know. And um, I suppose so, because there is no question of him. And um, I have another comment of Efe Parlak, who says that in, 
in uh, Turkey, in generally northern villages, where it says good rainwater, water is started to be stored underground dams, the pots, where transfers of water is got hard due to the geography, mountainous inclination. And there is a risk of landslide. There are also hydropower generators placed in water pipes near pumping stations in Western municipalities. So the question is related with climate change to the open dams and evaporations of water vapor has considerable effect on global warming. Um, I'm not too clear on that. So um, in Turkey, there's underground storage, kind of like a modified aquifer recharge. And yeah, asking about um, whether dams and evaporation has water vapor have considerable effect. Um, I don't think I'm clear on what the question is, sorry. <laughs> you can rephrase it, uh, please. And I go to the other question of a uh, Professor Gopa Kumar from India, and that say thank you very much for your presentation. And the question is how the change in hydrological patterns due to the climate change can be considered in the decision making process for the reoperation of dams for e flows. Yeah, so I think in the last part of my uh, presentation. I was looking at the different um, changes. So what happens when generally environment uh, flows to the Volta Lake go down and what happens when it increases? And you'll find that the requirement for low flows, which is that because of the natural flow of the Volta where you had naturally dry flows most of the year and some peak flows at certain times of the year, you can, um, you can restore some um, eco ec ecosystems and some, um, should I say, benefits of the natural river if the water flows are low at certain times. So if uh, climate change leads to a decrease in the inflows, there is some advantage for the environment because then we can strategically reoperate the dam to provide those low flows because there's really no water. There's nothing we can do. But if at least an increase in flows, the advantage is that then at certain times we would have to flood, which is also kind of going back. And you'll find that generally when the, the flooding occurs with um, the natural cycle. So just last year, they had to release for, I think, the third time. And it caused a lot of devastation. But this, if this becomes a climate change, Hopefully, we resettle the communities that have moved in land further away. And then you've got the floodplains flooding, and that also has some benefits. So that's uh, great for, um, well, that's great in terms of if we have two extremes in terms of climate change, we could look at how we can provide environmental flows. Thank you, Afua. And uh, I have a comment of Abel Imarai from Australia connected with the first question. And he writes, to some extent, yes, to your answer, sans Dr. Afua. The reason I ask is that temperature of e-releases could be a trait of consideration similarly. I cannot read here. So the reason I ask is that temperature of e E flows could be a trade off consideration. Yes, and that's true. I know in instances in South Africa where they release water and then like everything died because it was <laughs> so hot or too cold. It was just a shock to the system. Similarly, could salinity be mod moderated, modified to produce a better output? So, in the, the way to moderate the salinity in the Volta is to moderate the flows coming from um, the dam. So initially, if you if you think of the salt and freshwater interface, um, we have a situation where in the dry season, because the flow of the river is close to zero, the seawater could intrude much, much further to where almost the dams are, about 80 kilometers inland. And then in the high flow season, it would be pushed out. But now because of the standard 1,000 meter cube, it's at a certain 
plates, more or less. There's very little variation. So we we place in a, a sensor to monitor during the spring. Um, the sorry, people know the term, but during the time that <laughs> the tide moves in during spring, and we found that yes, there are peaks and it's changing, but it's not able to move as inland as it used to, and because of that, the lava is stuck. And actually, people point out that we are very lucky that the flow isn't a bit higher because had it been a bit higher, like 2,000 meter cube, then that sweet spot of 1% salinity would probably have moved into the Atlantic Ocean and then, like, forget the clams. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Rimad Afua. Uh, neat answer, Abel says. Uh, thank you. It may be useful to review Nathan Bowman's 2022 paper on map-based decision support framework for the Embel system. That is his comment, and I have a lot of. Hey, thanks. You have a lot of uh, congratulations for your presentation, and thank you for your presentation. Do we have an extra question? Don't see extra questions here. Well, if not, I had to say thank you very much to our speaker. It was really nice to have your presentation and the participation of all the persons that accompany us today and that they will see your video later. Again, I tell you that these presentations have been recorded and it will be uh, published at the YouTube of IEG Delft, where you can also find previous presentations. But for all the person who has registered, they will receive it online together with the some point of the presentation of Dr. Afua. Well, thank you very much again, and I wish you all the best for the new challenges. And it was a pleasure to have you as a speaker of the first event. Thank you Thank very you. much to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening and inviting me.